So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Barbara Lindsay. I'm the interim CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of BC. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special webinar. Um, it's called Raise Your Voice, Dementia, Long-Term Care, and COVID-19, sponsored by Clark Wilson, LLP. I'd like to start by acknowledging that the Society's Provincial Office is located on the um, unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh nations. January is recognized across the country as Alzheimer's Awareness Month, and it's an invaluable opportunity for us to have important conversations about the issues that are relevant to families affected by dementia. It'll help us move closer to changing the future, so it'll be for the betterment of all of us. I'd like to recognize in our audience today that we have the BC Liberal Leader and Critic for Senior Services and Long-Term Care, Shirley Bond. Thank you so much for listening in today, Shirley. Now I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's conversation, Emily Clough. <laughs> Emily is a partner at Clark Wilson LLP, and she has a long history of supporting families affected by dementia and planning for the future. She's a dear friend of the society and a special person to all of us here. So we're delighted, Emily, that you will be the moderator today. Over to you, Emily. Thank you so much, Barbara, and welcome everyone, and thanks for coming. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Wavefront Center for Communication Accessibility for providing ASL interpretation and closed captioning for today's event. If you need to take advantage of ASL, make sure you are using Gallery View and pin our interpreters, Samara Ferguson and Bree Kwan. I'd also like to recognize Tamara Kramer, who is doing live closed captioning. Today's event is being recorded. If you're running into technical challenges, Ben from McMedia is online to help. Please use the chat box and send him a private note. In any other year, Alzheimer's Awareness Month is an important time to shine a spotlight on issues affecting families living with dementia. However, because of the pandemic, we're facing a new world. The impact of COVID-19 on people who are living with a disease in long-term care and the family caregivers who support them cannot be overstated. This year's Alzheimer's Awareness Month theme is about helping to change the future for people affected by the disease. Having open, honest, compassionate conversations about how to address the challenges that COVID has presented, the isolation, the uncertainty, the frustration for families mm -hmm. to navigate restrictions is vital to changing the future. Conversations like this one we're having today brings us closer to finding a balance between respecting the complexities of public health and the challenges presented by dementia. Long-term care is experiencing a crisis and there are many differing opinions on how to solve that crisis, but we can't move forward without being able to talk about it. It's so important to hear from the people who are living with these experiences. Today, we are joined by four special guests who have different perspectives on the experience of dementia and long-term care. Joining us today are Craig Burns. Craig is a member of the Alzheimer Society of BC's Board of Directors, as well as a member of the BC Leadership Group of People Living with Dementia. Welcome, Craig. Naomi Meissen, sorry if I mispronounced your name, Naomi, <laughs> is a caregiver for her mother who is living with dementia in long-term care and is a member of the BC Leadership Group of Caregivers. Krista James is the National Director of the Canadian Centre for Elder Law, dedicated to improving the lives of older adults in their relationship to the law. And finally, we have Isabel McKenzie, British Columbia's Seniors Advocate, responsible for monitoring and analyzing senior services and issues in BC to advise the government on addressing systemic issues. Now, in addition to some questions we've prepared in advance, you can also ask our panelists a question by putting it into the chat box. If there is time at the end, I'll pose those questions to the group. This conversation will help inform the Alzheimer Society of BC's position on long-term care and will help the Canadian Centre for Elder Law in developing advocacy tools to help families. 
Today's event, well, excuse me. I'm gonna start by asking each one of our panelists to share a little bit about themselves and how this, is, this issue is affecting them. So Craig, let's begin with you. Can you tell us a bit about your experiences with long-term care and what your concerns are as somebody living with dementia, seeing the impact of the pandemic while looking ahead to what your own journey could be? For sure. <clears throat> my first experience uh, was, with, with, was when my mother was uh, at age 79, diagnosed with dementia and that was in 1999. We needed to make some changes early in the year 2000. First to relocate my mom from the Vancouver area to Kelowna where I live into an independent living facility. In 2006, it was necessary for mom to live in long-term care at that point. First in a non-health authority facility built in the 1960s. It was uh, an arrangement where it was either four persons per room or two persons per room, and that was the option that we had for my mom. Uh, very limited common areas with adequate staffing and care provided uh, for the residents. Our first choice was also a non-health authority facility, uh, which became available in about a year. It was, it was built in the 1990s, I believe. It was the arrangement of one person per room, and it had good indoor and outdoor common areas good staff resident ratio and very good care was provided. My mom passed on in 2011 at the age of 90. For myself, uh, I was diagnosed with dementia in the year 2006, although I had had memory problems for at least 10 years and was accessing the medical system to get some answers. I'm in my late 60s, I live on my own. I have married children and grandchildren who live close by and also in the Vancouver area. In 2019, I began my own planning process for my next living situation setting. I decided on a complex that includes independent living, assisted living and long-term care to make the transitions for me as seamless as possible. Also in February of 2020, just before the pandemic began, I had begun to take training at the long-term care facility to be a volunteer. With the pandemic, that training then ended very quickly. Uh, lastly, with the pandemic through this past year of 2020, I have put my relocation plans on hold for now. The facility has called me about openings, but at this time, uh, I will remain in my current home setting with the protocols, the restrictions, and the potential for virus infection in care facilities, I'm just not willing to take any of those risks. Thank you so much, Craig. Naomi, we'll turn to you. Your mother is currently living in long-term care and has been for years. How has your family's experience of that care changed since the pandemic started? So for me, I just I simply put, everything has changed. I can no longer um, see her in the way that I used to before I would visit her. I live in BC and my mom lives in Alberta. So there was already that geographical distance, but I was at least able to see her every two to three months, really with little incident. Unfortunately, since the start of the pandemic, I really have only been able to see her a handful of times. And in almost a year's time, I've only been able to access her room one time in October. And instead of enjoying the visit and really having that quality time to spend together, much of the visit was spent really just trying to do the things that you can to give the best care possible for your loved one. So for example, that would be, you know, changing out some books that she has, uh, getting rid of some magazines that have piled up, you know, um, even changing out a battery in her clock. They seem quite simple, but these are things that the home is not responsible for. And to speak to the home, you know, I really don't hold them accountable per se for a lot of the things that have happened because they are just following regulations that are, um, you know, deemed to them. 
but with all of these protocols in place, all of the restrictions in place, that still did not circumvent an outbreak from happening in October in her home, which resulted in my mom contracting coronavirus. So I think that the pandemic has really just exasperated and shone, shone a light on existing systemic issues. Thanks, Naomi. Over to Krista next. Now, Krista, as a lawyer, your perspective is grounded in legislation. One of the biggest roles for a caregiver is to act as a substitute decision maker. Can you talk about what this role entails? Yeah, so I'm going to talk for just a couple, mi couple minutes and I'm going to mention a couple resources so you can review them later on and Katie will put some links in the chat box. So the key thing that is in long term care, any non emergency healthcare treatment requires consent. And the physician, the nurse, the care facility manager, these people do not provide consent. They can recommend treatment and medication, but they don't provide consent. They have to get consent from the appropriate person. So when some treatment can be consented to in advance, basically in the care plan, and you probably met at the beginning if you are, are supporting someone living in long-term care and came up with a document that identified some medication that that would be provided that you agree to. But if, so if you're in long-term care, what this means is if a form of medication is being considered, then the treating physician, the nurse, they need to get consent either from the person living with dementia, if they can give consent for themselves, either on their own or with support from someone they trust, or if that person can't give consent for that healthcare themselves, they're going to a substitute decision maker. So a substitute decision maker is a person with the job to make healthcare decisions for someone else. And they might be appointed, like you, a person with dementia might have chosen their substitute decision maker for healthcare through a representation agreement in BC, different in other provinces. Or if they haven't chosen someone, then the healthcare provider needs to get consent from a family member or a friend. So if you are making healthcare decisions for someone living with dementia, you need to make an informed decision and you need to consult with the person who has dementia if they're able to participate in decision making. Those are two requirements by law. So we have a brochure and some videos and they're available on our website. We develop with the society and you can take a look at them. It covers this stuff. And another piece I just want to flag, because um, we've already seen a question on this issue, is medication that is used as a form of restraint. Often we say antipsychotics. So for this medication, there are other requirements and the, the, any facility needs to follow their own policies and also the rules for care facilities, which are in, for, put in legislation. And what they say is that you need the substitute decision makers permission for ongoing use. You can use it in, a, they can use it in an emergency context without consent for up to 24 hours. But after that, <clears throat> they need um, consent and they actually need that consent in writing. Um, so to be a good decision maker, you need to know how that person is doing and you need to, regular communication with the physician in some way. And for sure, COVID um, restrictions have created some challenges in terms of being physically present in long-term care, which make it challenging to be a good substitute decision maker. If you wanna know more about chemical restraints, we do have also a blog post that I've given the link to Katie. So she'll put that in the chat box as well if you wanna review all the rules about um, chemical restraints. Thanks, Krista. That's an important and ongoing topic I think will only expand, which is those use of restraints and how we get um, consent um, for that. Um, Isabel, I'd like to bring you into the conversation. In your role as the seniors advocate, you are responsible for monitoring and analyzing issues related to seniors. And even before the pandemic, long-term care experienced significant systemic challenges. Would you say that the pandemic has introduced new issues or simply exacerbated existing ones? Thanks, Emily. 
I think a little of both. So I think that for issues around staffing, both levels of staffing, fragmentation of staffing, those certainly existed prior to the pandemic. What the pandemic has done has revealed the degree to which staffing is insufficient in many cases, and also revealed the consequence of the fragmentation of the staffing. So it is unclear we would have recognized why it's important to have a more cohesive staff in a care home until we were presented with the challenges we need to, needed to address in response to the pandemic. Being able to find people, being able to do contact tracing, being able to do single site, all of those things were complicated by this fragmented system we have. I think another systemic challenge in long-term care that really existed before, will continue to exist after, really I'm not sure to what degree COVID exacerbated it, but is the degree to which in our long-term care system, not just in BC, but for the most part in Canada, uh, we've adopted a model that we're grouping people together because of their level of frailty or their condition not because of their individual likes, wants, personalities, backgrounds, experiences, or where they want to go. So when we talk about challenges in long-term care, part of it uh, certainly is around ensuring we have enough staff, the right staff, um, con continuity in our staffing. But I think the other part of it is making sure that we've created a, a social environment that um, uh, adapts to the individualism of the people there. So uh, in terms of new issues, I'm not sure if it's an issue so much. Uh, it is, I, I think, absolutely a revelation, um, particularly for people like myself who've worked in the sector, uh, which is the degree to which we have marginalized family members and um, marginalized the contribution they make to the actual care, health, and well-being of the people who live in long-term care. We certainly talk about the value of family members. We make our care homes welcoming to families. We have special occasions. We have rooms where families can have dinner together, et cetera, et cetera. But when the rubber hit the road in the pandemic and it came time to recognizing the essential uh, role that family members play in the health and well-being of their loved ones, we actually uh, did not embrace that. And I think that the day of reckoning has come that we are going to have to do that. And I think that it also underscored for those of us who talk a lot about uh, family caregivers and the burden of family, we focus a lot on community dwelling seniors and the burden of caring for somebody, family. What this revealed is there's a burden for some to not being able to be a family caregiver. Uh, and I don't think we realized that. So when we talk about the stress of these family separation and these visitor restrictions, it is, I would argue, equally uh, uh, difficult for the resident who is deprived of those meaningful visits, or in some cases, any visits, but also for that family member who is accustomed to spending a lot of time with their loved one who's been deprived of it. Uh, that, uh, I think we've underestimated the degree to which uh, that has had a profound effect on, on the visitor as well as the person being visited. Yeah, thank you for those important insights. Um, Naomi, I, I wanted to pose the next question to you. Moving someone living with dementia into a care home has always been an act of faith and a challenging decision for families to make. How has the experience of not being able to be with your mother because of the lockdown challenged your faith? Well, I definitely have to agree that this you know, putting someone in long-term care is one of the hardest decisions someone will ever have to make. Um, I, I see that there is a significant issue in that there is a large gap between keeping people at home and then putting them in long-term care. There's not a lot of supports in between. Um, so you really have a limited amount of options. And once somebody has progressed to a certain level, almost the only option is to be placed into long-term care. So I think that's you know something to consider there um, but 
in a greater sense, I mean, you realistically are entrusting your loved one to be cared for in the way that you would care for them given the opportunity, but you simply can't. So, I mean, for me and during this, you know, almost year of going through this, I mean, it's been a really hard pill to swallow, just not being able to access my mom and being dictated as to when, for how long, at what times, um, you know, and no say on any of the decisions that are being made. I, in the beginning of the pandemic, I had considered, you know, taking her out of long-term care so that I could administer the care. But unfortunately, I simply don't have the means whether it be financial, emotional, that kind of support, um, you know, to really keep her in home, despite, again, this being touted as the first approach when people are, um, you know, experiencing cognitive impairment. The other problem about, um, you know, considering moving her is that as soon as I were to move her out, that means that bed is now available and she goes to the bottom of an often two to three year waiting list to get another bed. So I'm very limited in that regard. And, you know, like Craig had mentioned, you know, if there were other options such as, you know, aging in place as somebody goes through, through these different stages of um, the disease and of the progression, you know, there, there may be more options uh, along that way. But for me, definitely, this has been a very difficult decision to make and also to experience um, when restrictions are, are put forth. Krista, let's bring it over to you for dealing, for people dealing with long-term care right now it can be confusing to understand how the rights of caregivers and people living with dementia have been affected by the state of emergency. Can you walk us through what's changed because of COVID-19? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Emily. So the short answer to the question in terms of the legal rights that I was talking about a moment ago is that in law, nothing has changed. Um, consent, responsibilities, and duties remain. They are responsibilities that physicians have ever as regulated professionals. And your duty to get informed consent and to consult, these are responsibilities you have as a person, as a caregiver who is substitute decision maker for someone. So those responsibilities have gone, have not gone away, but the context for exercising them has changed enormously. Um, I think the other piece to that story is that people living with dementia are people with disabilities. And so under human rights law, under constitutional law, they have a right to their disability being accommodated. And sometimes that means they need support with communication. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the essential visitors, you know, policy came to exist to recognize these human rights. Um, but support of caregivers is tremendously important. Um, legally and to quality of life. But whether or not, all this means that, that whether or not you technically have essential visitor or visitor status, if you are a substitute decision maker, you still have responsibilities. Some ways I find it more useful to think about having a responsibility than having a right, because you are trying to do something to support another person that you care about. Um, my sense from consulting with caregivers over the years is that it's always been challenging to make sure consent is happening in alignment with the law. And I expect things are, are, are so much harder now. Um, so fulfilling the role of a substitute decision maker, can, you can, it's way more difficult without ongoing in-person presence, but there may be strategies that you can apply to be able to um, do some of the substitute decision making work across distance. And I encourage you to think strategically about how you work with care facilities. It must be enormously frustrating. Um, and it can be hard to be our own self advocate. That's why people hire lawyers to go to court and represent them. When your heart is engaged, it's so, so hard to dispassionately advocate for what you need and what is right. Um, so I have a couple things to say specifically, and I one thing I would say is be really clear with physician, with the directive care facility, when um, that your need to 
to go to the facility or speak with someone is about exercising your role as substitute decision maker and consenting to medication. Don't let that get confused with visitor. Like the visitor notion is terribly named that degrades the role of caregivers, but it's the stupid title we have to work with. But in the meantime, don't let them think you're there just to visit. And I don't want to undervalue visiting. It's critical. But Make it clear if you're there to exercise your legal responsibilities as a substitute decision maker. And the second thing is try to be really creative about how to exercise those responsibilities across distance or with remote strategies. So I'm talking about phone calls, um, setting up meetings in advance. Most of the physicians, and these are the ones who decide what medication, they're actually not in long-term care very much, right? They have another office, they're at the hospital meet with them off-site, offer to meet with them off-site at their convenience. Um, ask for a video of how um, the person is doing. Um, it's so, so hard, but there may be some sort of workarounds that allow you to do your best right now, but sometimes you may need to advocate for being present, whether you're an essential visitor or a visitor or not. Thanks, Krista. And those are important insights that Krista made, and we heard from Isabel as well, about the essential role of family caregivers and that difference that we have between making the decision and the um, information and responsibility of being a decision maker and, and the visiting, which may be the same thing, but they, they can be different. Krista had mentioned a couple of strategies there um, that she would recommend when working with care facilities. And I would open it up to Craig and Isabel and Naomi, if they have any strategies or if they have anything else to say about the challenges that caregivers have faced regarding decision making. Oh, I, I just want to make a little comment to, uh, to Krista's uh, advice that she gave. Um, I think that's excellent about meeting the uh, doctor offsite because at the moment uh, we have one doctor that is facilitating, facilitating care for almost 100 residents and they have not been there throughout the lockdown and throughout the outbreak so they're not always the best um, you know, person to represent what's going on at the home. Um, so I appreciate uh, the suggestion to meet offsite. Um, for me, I know that something that I would really appreciate is just some continued level of communication uh, with your loved one, you know, similar to what was going on before. It might not physically be in person, but whether that's offering, you know, landlines or the home purchases, some tablets to facilitate virtual chats, um, you know, window visits, outside visits, any anything that you can, um, you know, you can help towards keeping that level of communication, I think is is needed. And, and that is only going to be possible once you hire more staff. I was waiting. I saw you were unmuted, Craig, if there's anything you wanted to say. Oh. Or else no, I'll I would, move on. I would, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to keep up here, uh, to be quite honest. And uh, I, I would defer to Isabel uh, to uh, provide some, some tips. Thank you. Well, a couple of comments. So first on uh, how to get into um, the care home. And I, I, I am very frustrated. I'm sorry, my phone said something back there. Uh, I am very frustrated by the fact that uh, when you look at the guidelines, just a minute, I'm going to turn off something here. Um, sorry about that. Um, I am very frustrated by the fact that when we look at the guidelines for essential visitors uh, and the supporting um, documentation and we look at who's in long-term care, every resident who wants one should have an essential visitor. And if they uh, don't qualify, I question why they're in long-term care. So there is a, a, a big frustration there. And the biggest piece of advice I can give 
is to go armed with the actual documents that speak to the fact, starting with essential visits will be evaluated in partnership with the resident or their substitute decision maker. And where it says that essential visits include compassion care, including critical illness, but also visits that are paramount to the resident's physical care and mental uh, well being, and that they include. Um, assistance, not just with feeding and personal care, but with communication assistance for people with hearing, visual, speech, cognitive, intellectual, or memory impairments. So uh, that's about 60 to 70% of our residents right there. And um, visits for supported decision-making. So apropos the comments about consent for medication. And so when you take that in, um, a, an operator is going to have a difficult time explaining why your mom, dad, husband, or wife uh, doesn't qualify for an essential visitor. So, and if there is that dispute, then go as quickly as possible to the health authority through their PCQO process in which they've committed to um, accelerate the essential visitor uh, issues to, to try and resolve quickly. And it becomes quite important right now because essential visitors are going to receive the vaccine and uh, social visitors are not uh, going to receive the vaccine. And so what do visits look like when we open them up in March is unclear to me in the context of it are, is the focus of the opening up going to be on the essential visitors, which is problematic because that is only about 20% or less of our residents who have essential uh, visitors. So that's in terms of, of how to get access. And in terms of the issue around decision-making and autonomy and rights and all of this, I have to believe that when we're on the other side of this pandemic, uh, there's going to be a looking back uh, probably by many in the legal community uh, around what rights did we, if any, breach uh, through this pandemic. It has been difficult to take that road right now because we're right in the thick of, of this pandemic and things are changing. And now we're on, I, I think that um, there'll be some distance, there'll be some reflection. And what might come out of it is actually a stronger recognition of the rights irrespective of whether it's a pandemic or administration of uh, uh, narcotics or whatever, a stronger recognition of the rights of the residents who live in long-term care and assisted living. Thanks, Isabel. Here's the question for all of you. Um, right now, there are people living with dementia in care who are unable to understand restrictions or why they cannot see the people they care about and depend upon for support. How do we address this very real, very immediate concern? And I turn that to you, Craig, to start. Um, thank you. Um, it is a, it's a, it's a difficult, it's a very heartbreaking situation, especially for the residents in the facilities who, um, with memory loss, you can share the information and it's gone three minutes later and you can remind again and it's gone again and it's very, very frustrating. I, I've experienced that on both sides now, really. Um, there are some steps that have been uh, made, uh, which I'm, I'm pleased about. Um, I have a couple of um, suggestions. I believe this is, might be relevant to it. Um, the subject of rapid testing, uh, I believe, is something that needs to be addressed for workers in the, in the facilities to mitigate the spread of the virus. Uh, it's a safer environment for the residents and the staff. It has been recommended by the BC Care Providers Association. Um, and from what I understand, uh, asymptomatic workers are a problem. I believe that's one area that can be addressed as far as the rapid testing. The second part is... Um, uh, the statement, it has already been discussed here, but the, uh, the statement or the protocol from the BC Center for Disease Control um, provides clarity on about designated primary care um, partners to be in contact as much as possible. Um, in person is the best way. Technology would be next and phone call, I guess, is after that. And also that social visitors should be able to visit as well. 
uh, when I look at this uh, from the past, as far as my mother, I can't imagine, and I don't want to go down that path because we're not going there, but I, I can't imagine pandemic for my mother uh, and myself. So I empathize with those who are here today who are dealing with that. Um, I'll just leave it at that and, and turn that to the next person. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to um, Naomi. We were talking about um, people who are living in demand, living with dementia and care facilities and may not be able to understand the restrictions and why it is they cannot see or have their usual interactions with their family members who they are used to. Absolutely. I think this is probably one of the most devastating parts of this uh, pandemic and the response is, you know, you can explain it, you can, you know, try to provide logic behind why these decisions are being made. But I really don't believe that that negates the feeling of loneliness and the isolation. They, they don't know what's going on, but all they know is that you are not there in the way that you once were. So to me, when I read the report um, from Isabel's office, and just noting that 70% of visitors were not allowed to touch their loved one is devastating. Like I just, it breaks my heart to think that to me, sometimes when my mom is not in the right space to be able to have a conversation or she's just not there, or in some people's cases, their disease has already progressed to the level where they're non-communicative or you know are no longer able to, to voice what's going on. There's something about touch that transcends logic, words, you know, that gap that you're missing. And, and I think given, you know, the staff levels and PPE, if that was in place, I don't see the harm of holding somebody's hand. If you're wearing gloves and you have the right equipment, I don't see the harm in that. And I think that that is something that could be addressed immediately to make a significant difference. Thanks, Naomi. Krista, can I turn it over to you for any comments you may have? Sure. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that in all the research I've done on dementia, one of the themes that comes up over and over again is person-centered care. And it reminded that every single person living with dementia is unique and their needs are unique and what's going to make them feel safe and comfortable and well cared for is unique. So and they're gonna to respond to tr the trauma of abandonment in different ways too. So I think what that means is that we can't take a single approach to every person. We have to find out what that person needs to feel companionship and safety and good and address their unique needs and think about how we can support them with and without family. Like, you know, the example Naomi just gave if the person needs to have their be touched and if the family member can't come in that day, how can we adapt their professional care so it involves physical touch in a safe way, like figure out what their needs are. Um, uh, the other thing is that my experience with people living with dementia personally is that they will come up with their own narrative to explain what's going on. And it might make sense to you and it might make not sense to you, but the more you fight their experience and their version of reality, the more you increase their distress and confusion. So if they've got their own story, you know, my grandmother, her story was her husband was on a fishing trip and we just worked around that always. So, so as you come up with a, a way to support them, I would say we need to go to their reality as well and work around it so that we're not creating unnecessary anxiety for them. So if they have, if for them, this pandemic is reminding them of another life experience, and can you support them in a way that just runs with that reality, right? We want to minimize distress, but also recognize that as for the care providers that all this change is trauma and stress for them. And that's going to manifest in behaviors that are going to get labeled challenging for some people. Um, and it's, that is a problematic scenario. So we need to find everything we can do to support people with dementia and long-term care so they don't feel distressed and afraid and confused. Um. Thanks, Krista. Isabel, I wanted to turn this over to you. And as well, I'll ask you next about your report. Naomi had uh, reference that report and the recommendations you have therein. So I'll turn the floor over to you for a few minutes. Thanks. So one of the uh, 
probably many of you are aware of the report we did uh, that came out in November that really reflected it was the voice of uh, 14,000 uh, family members and residents in long-term care and assisted living about the impact of these visit restrictions. And remember that these people were answering the survey in September. Uh, we're now in January and visit restrictions are no different now than they were in September. So uh, all of the anxiety and the heartbreak that we heard through the survey has simply grown in uh, over the, the five months between when people were answering that survey and today. And it looks like there's a couple of more months to go before we are potentially on the other side of the very restrictive visit restrictions that we are experiencing now. What came out of the survey that I found was very interesting was we asked people how frequently they visited prior to the pandemic versus now. And what I think, where I think we were not particularly creative in how to manage uh, visits safely, we took a rather uh, blanket approach. So further to Krista's comments about the uniqueness of individuals, so too were the visit circumstances unique. So when you think about who is the person that would be most profoundly impacted was going to be those residents who had family members visiting almost daily or daily. That is not every resident in long-term care, not because family members don't care, the practicalities, they may not live in the same city as their family member, uh, they may have no family member, their family member may work and, and only did come to visit uh, on the weekend for an hour. For those people, the experience has not been dramatically different. Uh, it's been somewhat different and it was certainly different for four months. But that group for whom those visits were very frequent and they were long, they've had a profound uh, impact. And we, we, we could have looked at just that group of people and how to support those visits more safely. Because when you read um, some of the palliative experiences and some of the milestones in life where people were separated and the ridiculousness of some of the infection control measures where it was gown, glove, mask, and plexiglass, right? Um, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, it, they're not all meant to be used in, in combination. I, I think that as I say, when we are on the other side of this, and it is clear in practical terms that we are where we are until we're on the other side of it. So one of the questions, you know, what can we do immediately? Well, I think the practical realities of it are that until we get long-term care fully vaccinated um, and there is uh, a view of protection, uh, we are not gonna see any relaxation of these visit restrictions. And it's unclear to what degree the visit re restrictions will be relaxed as we progress through our vaccination schedule. I don't think we're gonna throw the doors wide open on the first day. I think it will be more incremental than that. But we're going to look back and I think and I hope that we will come out of this with a greater, not just understanding, but respect for the role that family members play as a caregiver in long-term care, not just in the community, in long-term care. I think that, um, you know, I made three recommendations in the report. Two of them are simply not going to happen. Uh, one of them was uh, every uh, resident should be able to have an essential care partner. That didn't happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, the next one was that uh, the uh, number of visitors allowed in addition to the essential visitors should be made with a view to reuniting families and mitigating risk, that's not going to happen. Uh, although that may be an approach when we start uh, after people are vaccinating. But the third recommendation, which was to create a provincial body that uh, would bring together the voice of resident and family councils throughout the province, that one we still can do. And I will be pursuing that, that vigorously. The time and attention for that is not there right now. Time and attention right now is focused on Let's get people vaccinated. Let's slow uh, transmission that, that we have in the community now. Fair enough. But one of the things that was very striking for me, and I thought 
we should be having this provincial association before COVID, of all the decisions that have been made, all the stakeholders, and many of you may have heard all the fuss and feathers over this report that came out and 40 stakeholder groups were consulted and was all about how did we do in long-term care, there wasn't a single resident or family member consulted. And to be fair, it's because who do you go to that represents the resident and family? Each care home, in theory, has a resident and family council, and the relationship is between the care home and that family council. We need to widen that. We need to make resident and family councils have a relationship with health authorities and with the provincial government, and we need to give them a provincial level voice. Uh, we can only improve the experience of living in long-term care by listening to the people who live there and the people who love them. And we may disagree with what they want, but it's their life, it's their choice. And until you live that experience, I don't know, I think people can have empathy, but it is not the same as living that experience, either as the person living there or as the family member of the person living there and what that means. You know, Naomi said, um, you're looking for somebody who will take care of your mom or dad or your husband or wife in the way that you would, if you could, right? We need to remember that the people who are going to get involved are the people who care the most. That's why they're involved. That's the other sort of boat we missed in all of this around these devoted family caregivers. They are the ones who are most invested in making sure that their loved one doesn't get COVID. They're going to take the most precautions around ensuring that they have not exposed themselves to the risk of contracting this virus and bringing it to their loved one. There will be some who will choose to sacrifice the visit in order for the safety of their people. You have to re also remember that in the survey, everybody didn't disagree with the visit restrictions. Most people did, but not everybody. Again, there's no, there was no question asked in which 100% of respondents gave the same answer, right? So we're never going to have a solution. I'm always cautious when people say, everybody says, that's never so. <laughs> Most people, many, <laughs> maybe. Everybody, no. Um, and that's true of these visit restrictions. But um, I think we, we have to, like all things when you live collectively, um, you collective decision-making is generally not made by the minority. Thanks, Isabel. I, I wanted to um, touch on a topic that you just talked about, which was in your recommendations in your report and which you've brought up here, which is that role for family councils. And, and seeing to have that those family councils have a broader voice, not just with the care facility, but provincially through a bigger uh, uh, way so that those voices get right to the decision makers. I, I wanted to flip that over to either Craig or Naomi to see if you had any comments on that or on what um, Isabel had said, particularly about the family councils. Thank you very much, Isabel, for explaining that. I, I appreciate it. The Family Council, I think it's an excellent idea, and, and I'll, I'll use this um, way of thinking. Uh, I'll think of it as the glass half full rather than half empty. What, what, would the, what authority will the Family Council have on decision making uh, in the long run? Uh, I, I, so, and I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to point that out to you to have an answer for it specifically, but that's my, that, that's my main question. I, I believe in the family councils because I believe that the resident councils uh, do have, do important work and good work, but where, where, where is the authority going to come from and uh, to be able to do something with it? I think the idea would be that right now in the regulations, we speak to uh, a resident council, a family council, some are together, resident and family councils in the same care home. And the idea is not that they have authority to um, uh, compel operators to do something or not do something. The idea would be that we would move it beyond what it really is right now, which is a group of people who meet with the operator 
and issues are discussed with the operator and elevate it to a structure that would allow health authorities and the provincial government to understand what systemic issues might be existing in long-term care from the perspective of residents and their family members. So when you have uh, stakeholder groups, when you have decision-making tables, they're not making the decisions per se, but they're providing input to the decisions. Right now, throughout this entire pandemic, uh, where long-term care has been the epicenter of all the stakeholders and all the people consulted and all the bodies around the table, none of them are a family member or resident or representing that voice. Some will say they represent that voice. They're the operators, they're the unions of the, they don't. The voice is the family members and the residents. And I mm -hmm. think that the visit restrictions is, is but one example. I think there are others where that would have been an important voice to hear. And once we're on the other side of the pandemic, and we're looking at this, uh, our long-term care system in British Columbia, I think it's going to, going to be crucial to hear that voice uh, at a provincial level and at a health authority level. I totally agree with you, Isabel, and thank you so much for that suggestion to sort of um, empower the resident and family councils to really have that direct line of communication with people that are making these decisions. Because like you said, I think this is a unique perspective that is only understood if you are living it. And without that voice at the table, you're simply not capturing that side of it and who it directly impacts. These decisions directly impact these people and not the regulation bodies or the unions or, you know, who are at the table. Um, so I know for me personally, you know, I'm very engaged. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of avenues that I have found to kind of express the concerns that I have, but I wasn't really even as aware about the ability to create these councils until recently. Um, so, you know, I think there needs to be also some onus on the long-term care facilities about, and just in general, the government and um, these different bodies that this is available to residents and families if they are wanting another avenue to express concerns. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm mindful um, of the time, and I think this is discussion that we all could have for quite a long time. As we have all seen, we have seen it personally, we've seen it systemically, we've seen it um, from the bigger picture that Isabel has brought to us through her surveys about these issues. I think we could spend a long time uh, thinking about what has happened, how we balance um, the needs of the care facilities to provide good care with the needs of individuals to have their autonomy, their dignity, their care as they want it, not as somebody else wants it, but as they want it, that is re reflective and thoughtful of their needs, their circumstances. As Krista has said, um, that we meet people where they are, not where we think they ought to be or somewhere different. Unfortunately, just due to time, we won't be able to take questions today. However, um, we do recommend that um, you can email the Alzheimer's Society by emailing them at advocacy at alzheimerbc.org to continue this conversation and perhaps your questions can go through there. I wanted to briefly pass this over to Robert. Robert has showed up on your screen there. He is the chair of the Alzheimer's Society Board of Directors, and he'll have some closing remarks for us. Thanks very much, Emily. And thank you for doing such an amazing job hosting and moderating this discussion on such an important topic. Um, I wanna also thank, uh, provide a very big thank you to our tremendous panelists, to Craig, Krista, Naomi, and Isabel, um, and to our, our key sponsor here, Clark Wilson LLP. Um, thank you to each of you on the, on the line for, for joining us for this important conversation about an issue affecting so many families across the province and across the country, really. Um, as we have heard, helping people affected by dementia, those who reside in long-term care and their families and caregivers has become much more difficult during the pandemic and has resulted in some truly heartbreaking stories. But I've learned a lot from the speakers today, and I hope you have as well, because they've all brought a different perspective to this important discussion and 
I'm truly hopeful that as the Alzheimer's Society of BC and all those who are working towards improving these circumstances um, continue to have these types of discussions and engage the relevant decision makers in productive dialogue to ensure that our loved ones who have dementia and their caregivers are going to continue getting the best care possible in whatever way we can. Um, I'm truly encouraged as well because I've seen time and again how much love, care, and energy so many people have brought to this discussion and continue to bring, forward, bring it forward all the time. Um, as I said, I hope everyone on the line has learned something from the discussion. If you would like to learn more about advocacy, um, we encourage you to visit the Alzheimer's Society of BC website at www.alzheimerbc.org. Um, you can also always call the First Link Dementia Helpline for information and support. And finally, I want to provide or give one last very special thank you to you again for attending and participating in this important discussion. And that's from everyone at the Alzheimer's Society of BC. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks.